I do have the tech I had, I didn't have my presentation. Everybody here, could you look towards me, please? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session on the future of the Internet of Things. We'll be talking about how to get to a more secure future with more human-centered devices. Uh, we're joined today by panelists from around the world. Uh, we'll be visiting uh, Ghana, Indonesia, Germany, Zambia, um, and we're going to uh, split this session in two rounds. In the first round, we're going to hear from the first two speakers. Um, we'll be hearing from Benedict uh, Abenroth from Microsoft, Senior Security Program Manager. And we'll be hearing from Walid al Sakaf, who is the Senior Lecturer at Sutterton University and is a board of, is, sits on the Board of Trustees for ISOC also. Um, after that, those two initial comments, we'll take questions, and then we'll continue uh, with our remaining speakers from around the world, who I look forward to introducing you to. My name is Solana. I work with the Mozilla Foundation. I'm based here in Berlin, um, and I come to this field um, with a great degree of recent interest because we've just published uh, a publication ourselves, uh, which is called 
privacy included, rethinking the smart home. Um, and as part of our annual uh, publication that Mozilla does where we look at uh, smart home devices and try and assess them on privacy and security. Um, and in the context of this work, in talking to many people who are experts on this topic and who are working at different levels to try and figure out how to solve these, whether it's in the home or in cities or at the national level, I know that we'll be looking at the full range um, of this problem and uh, the opportunities afforded by IoT as part of this discussion. Um, so I would like to start by welcoming Benedict um, to give us his perspective from Microsoft. I think so. All right. Um, thank you for providing me with the opportunity today to speak. Um, also, a special thank you to the organizers of this um, session. My name is Benedict, and I work at Microsoft at our headquarters in Redmond, and I lead the security strategy of an, of an IoT product called Azure Sphere. And today I wanted to talk about three things. Uh, first, the proliferation of IoT, specifically in the context of microcontrollers. Second, the security risks that those devices are facing. And then third, what we at Microsoft think is necessary to protect against the threats they're facing. So uh, as I'm the first speaker, I wanted to set the stage briefly by talking about how massive the impact of IoT already is and uh, will for sure continue to be. Uh, you've probably heard many numbers in terms of how many IoT devices there are. Um, I don't think it really matters which number you choose. What you have to take away is that it's a, it's a very large number. The one estimate that I uh, usually like to refer to is that there are about 80 billion connected things by 2025. So um, if you put that into context of how many people there will be, that is a very impressive number. So why is that number actually so high? Um, I think at a high level, there are two reasons for why that number is so high. Uh, first, from a technology perspective, I think we've seen several trends over the last decade that have spurred the growth of IoT, um, one being declining hardware costs, uh, another one being the miniaturization of sensors, and another one being the um, emergence of hyperscale cloud computing. Those things together have enabled IoT to increase at such a large scale. Um, and because of that, anything from airplanes, elevators, solar panels, uh, toys, even soap dispensers now can be connected to the internet. Um, I think second also, from a consumer and industry perspective, there are a lot of benefits that come with connecting devices. Um, for example, sensors can detect whether there is a gas leak in a house and it can notify rescue services and its residents. Um, enterprises can monitor millions of devices that are deployed and they don't need to send a technician to check on each single one. So I think those are the reasons at a high level of why IoT is growing so much and it's frankly also a large opportunity for industry and businesses. Um, it introduces completely new business models, it can change existing ones and that is a huge market that a lot of companies are obviously trying to to capture. So to sum up, I think there's a few reasons why that um, number for IoT devices is so large. Um, as I said in the beginning, I wanted to focus on one particular category of IoT devices. Um, and first of all, what does IoT actually mean? Um, IoT can mean many things. Um, one of the nice things about IoT is that there's no universally agreed on definition. So um, there's many different viewpoints. But at its core, we think that it's about a new concept of how we interact with the physical world. And one particular area of IoT are microcontrollers. Um, and what you see here on the left side is one, one example. Um, and just in that category alone, 9 billion new MCU power devices are built and deployed each year. Um, so that is a, a huge number. And those devices are very, very small. A microcontroller can be the size, uh, the size of a thumbnail. And they're basically in everything. They're in street lamps, refrigerators, washing machines, HVACs, microwaves, medical devices. Um, yeah, one might actually be in the microphone here as well. Um, MCUs were actually introduced in the early 70s and brought uh, very simple computing to 
many different devices. But historically, MCUs weren't really connected to the internet. And today, in fact, only 1% of those MCUs out there are uh, connected to the internet. Um, but that number of 1% is definitely about to change. Uh, what you see here is a diagram of one of the first MCUs that has a radio built right into the die. Uh, when we saw this for the first time in 2014, uh, we knew this was, would kick off a huge shift in, in the IoT world. Um, and this particular chip that you see here, if you would have bought it in a volume of about 100,000 devices in uh, 2014, uh, it would have cost about $2.50. So think about that number for a second. For basically the cost of a cup of coffee, you can now add the internet connectivity to pretty much anything. And I think that is very fascinating. But as with most things, technology with a lot of opportunities to also come a lot of risks. And that is something that I wanted to talk about as well today. There's a new headline about IoT devices being hacked pretty much every single day. Fridges sending spam, baby monitors being used to spy on families. Someone even used a fish tank thermometer to infiltrate a corporate network. And of course, we all remember the Mirai botnet attack that took down a vast majority of the internet on the East Coast for the better part of a day in September 2016. And the consequences of all these incidents are very severe. Uh, when a device is compromised, it can have an impact on your privacy, your data, your infrastructure, and with the Internet of Things, even on your physical security. And as we learned from Mirai, it can even have a larger social and economic impact. So who is behind all of these attacks? Um, what you see here on the left is a categorization that is used by the US government. And what you can see, and when you go into the details of what the motives and interests are, is that all of their methods and interests and motives are very, very broad. Um, there's a lot of different actors. Um, some of them might want to damage your infrastructure and entire industries. Others want to promote specific agendas with highly visible attacks. Some want to steal intellectual property, sensitive data. Some might just do it for fun and for recognition. Um, so I think what it is important to state here is that overall the range of attack of actors behind those attacks and IoT devices and any network or system broadly um, is very, very broad and their motives can be very different. Um, but what is clear is that behind all of these different motives is the fact that every single IoT device, from a soap dispenser to a car, they're all facing many, many threats. So what you see here on the next slide is um, how those attackers actually gain access to an IoT device. Um, so the question is, what do they see when they look at an IoT device? If you're a hacker, this is basically what you see. Uh, that's the, the battlefield for a device level attack. Um, this is what you see when you try to, let's say, want to hack into a connected medical device. Uh, starting at the bottom, you can gain access uh, via physical access to the device. You can use one of the IOs. You can leverage a vulnerability in the operating system anything in the network stack that connects the operating system to the network or the cloud. You can compromise the communication itself if a weak encryption is used. You can get access via an application if there's um, flaws in the security of that app. Um, and you can basically attack any of the levels that you see here. Um, as you can see, these attack surfaces are pretty limited when you think about it from a, from a theoretical perspective. But what is unlimited is the way attackers can compromise those attack surfaces. And hackers can get very creative and innovative. The bad guys can just innovate as much as, as the good guys, basically. So what can happen when an IoT device hacks an IoT, when, when a bad actor hacks an IoT device? Well, a lot of things can happen, actually. Um, one example being a device can be completely bricked and held for ransom. Imagine someone blocking a thermostat in your house in the middle of the winter and demanding you pay $100 to get heat again to your house. They can also be controlled for malicious purposes. Um, there's actually been vulnerabilities found in pacemakers that would have allowed an attacker to administer shocks to the patient. Data can be stolen and privacy can be breached. Um, attackers could, for example, gain access to the location of someone and pretty much track their location 24-7. Data can even be changed. Imagine an oil rig that is using about 80,000 sensors to collect millions of data points and just changing a few of them that could have huge consequences on how that oil rig is operated. 
Um, or you could just use a device to gain access to a network with the example of the, the fish tank thermometer that I've mentioned. So I think when you all add it up, we can all agree that those are things that shouldn't happen. Um, so I just wanted to mention one brief example of using a device for malicious purposes. Um, if you look at one example here, I think what manufacturers more broadly should think about is that um, what are the risks that users of those devices are facing and in what environment do they operate in. So although you might think that a stovetop compared to let's say a car might not have the same level of consequences, think about someone weaponizing a stovetop in someone's home, opening the gas valve, igniting the ignition. Those are things that can have very, very severe consequences. So we think that every single IoT device, every single user deserves to be protected sufficiently. So the question is, how can you achieve that level of protection for all those devices running on MCUs? Uh, in our research, uh, we have learned that in order to be highly secure for all of those devices, um, you should at least have seven properties. I won't go into the technical detail here, and if you want to learn more about it, you can um, use the search engine of your choice or look at the link at the bottom of the slide. But um, in a nutshell, a device is only as secure as its weakest link. And we have determined that these are the protections that are required to secure a connected device in the threat landscape that I just laid out. Some of those properties are delivered in hardware, some are delivered in software, some depend on the network or the cloud service. But together, these properties work to protect the connected device uh, from all the attacks that I've mentioned and also allow the security to be renewed if a compromise has happened and it enables them to be updated over time because many devices that are connected in nowadays IoT landscape aren't just being used for one or two years. Many of them are deployed for 10 years or even longer. So we've outlined these properties and the research behind them in, in the research paper. And um, if you'd like to, feel free to have a look. And finally, I'd like to conclude with what governments are actually doing to uh, address that space. Um, in the US, um, the most prominent example recently is probably California, which has passed legislation that will require IoT devices to have certain minimum security standards for passwords. Um, there's several bills that are introduced in Congress being discussed right now. In Europe, most people should be familiar with the EU Cybersecurity Act that will introduce cybersecurity certification frameworks that will very likely include IoT devices as well. Um, most governments, one example being the UK, are actively working on uh, informants, informing certain standards um, with their work. In Asia Pacific, the Japanese government, for example, even started a campaign in which they tried to test the password security of 200 million publicly available IoT devices. And most recently, uh, just last month, a joint report was published by the Singapore and Dutch cybersecurity agencies uh, that called for governments to play a more active role in securing IT devices. And I'd like to conclude with um, getting back to the Mirai botnet attack that I mentioned in the beginning. That attack took place in sept September 2016. Uh, that is, at least in the technology space, a very, very long time. It's more than three years ago. And I think someone would have a really hard time arguing that much has improved in the state of IoT cybersecurity since then. Uh, so we probably all agree that consumers deserve better protection, and I hope this panel will move the needle forward in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Walid al -Sakaf. Yes. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being on this panel. Um, I would like to emphasize here that both I have uh, two hats. Uh, one is as an academic working on internet uh, studies and the other is on the board of uh, the Internet Society. Uh, but of course, I will not use the latter hat as much as I can. Simply looking at it from um, a theoretical, let's say, scholarly perspective. Um, and one of the interesting things that we do as scholars is often look into data, and data helps us understand reality around us. And here I'd like to uh, use the opportunity to refer to some recent research that's been uh, done by the Internet Society in collaboration with uh, Consumer International because uh, there is really very little one entity can do in this space given the fact that uh, the idea of uh, Internet of Things itself is rather complex and broad. So what is it that users like and what is it that they think of when it comes to uh, Internet of Things? And that's the question of perception or attitudes, so to speak. 
So I'd like maybe to uh, get this uh, going by uh, perhaps asking the audience here about the same questions and just to get to see if, if it matches <laughs> and let it, seeing the reliability of, of doing that. So how many of those in the room, maybe you can raise your hand uh, based on the question I asked just to get to see if it matches. So should the regulators be the ones that uh, take into account privacy and security standards in the Internet of Things? How many of you think the regulators are supposed to be the ones that do that? Cool, on the panel as well? <laughs> about less than half, okay. Um, how about the manufacturers themselves? The manufacturers so are suppo be, supposed to be the ones that uh, should be taking those into account. You say yes to all of them, or do you have to pick one? <laughs> well, one by one to see if it la links well with the data. So, a fewer hands, actually. Uh, my uh, and, uh, yes, <laughs> on the panel here. I don't want to give you extra weight. <laughs> You're just a participant here. All right, and so another thing is, you know, for every single Internet of Things device, you have a number of players. So you have the, obviously, the manufacturers, and you have the regulators allowing that particular piece of Internet of Things to come into the country and being sold, and also the retailers, which is the level where you communicate directly with the consumers. So how many of you think that retailers should also be the ones championing in privacy and security standards uh, in the Internet of Things? Retailers. One? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, uh, just to give you a sense of how far detached <laughs> this group is, uh, it's 88% of those uh, that have been surveyed in this survey, which is uh, a number of um, uh, users, 1,000 users, from each from uh, about five countries. And so, um, countries were Australia, Canada, and Jap uh, France, Japan, uh, actually six countries, UK and the US. So this, is, was, uh, this was the sample, I mean, a thousand from each of those countries. And the question about whether, this is uh, the consumers speaking, whether they thought that privacy and security standards should be assured by regulators, it was a whopping 88%. So close to 90%, so it was the regulators, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the regulators, meaning the governments. Um, and. Interestingly enough, that was much higher, let's say at least a bit of a percentage when it comes to here. So manufacturers were the 81% that were found to be those that should be responsible for setting up the uh, standards for privacy and security. Then came the retailers being 80%. So, I mean, in terms of the uh, order, I think it matches. But in terms of the enthusiasm in this room, maybe it also plays a role that you're in the late afternoon. And uh, I'm assuming that we can multiply that by three, <laughs> looking at the activity. So this is basically an indicator that how consumers think when it comes to Internet of Things. Regulators come apparently on top. And uh, this applies basically to these rather industrial countries. It's difficult to know if it would apply also to developing countries or others that have uh, maybe fewer number uh, of uh, Internet of Things. But within the survey also, w there were also additional uh, questions uh, when it comes to how they view the Internet of Things themselves. So um, maybe another question, uh, maybe to the panel in this case, since you're the most active in voting. How many of you think uh, that you should distrust the way data is shared on Internet of Things devices. Distrust. <laughs> distrust. Okay, almost not full. You, you actually trust in the way data is shared on Internet of Things? <laughs> okay, you also join. So I'm not involved, so I'd say 10, 100%. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> All right, how many of you think that people find, uh, I mean, how do you, many of you think or feel that Internet of uh, Things devices are creepy? <laughs> creepy in the sense that you know, you're really a bit wary of what it does. Yes, yeah. Okay, yes as well? You, I mean, I'm it, selling one. So you're selling one? <laughs> you're, you're conflicted, <laughs> I guess. And here on this side, you also find them creepy? Yeah, yeah. good, so that, the level of those, uh, um, I'll give you first the questions and then come to the results. Then 
here the question is about people who know uh, how to disable data. I mean, do you actually know how to disable? I mean, it's a bit of a personal question, but you're free to answer. Do you know how to disable data uh, collection on your devices, the ones that you use at home? One, two, three. Is this yes or no? <laughs> to the extent that it's possible. I mean, yeah. Cool. So basically around, I'd say, 60, 70 percent. All right. So and the last question would be, how many of you on the panel uh, would own a smart device and will not buy one due to security concerns? I mean, you would not own, neither buy one because of security concerns. You'd be quite worried. <laughs> You already have? <laughs> ah, okay, so, mm -hmm. so you all own one and you're not worried about, you know, I mean, there are some people that may actually never buy an Internet of, of uh, Things device because they are worried about secu security concerns. They mo mainly believe that the risk is too high for me to take advantage of the functionality. Good, so now are we ready for the results? Some of you already know, but it's a 75% of people distrust the way data is shared. 75% of the, those that have been surveyed say they distrust the, day, the way data is shared. 63% find the connected, uh, the, uh, that connected devices are creepy. So now we're talking about attitudes of individuals. 63% of those feel that, yeah, they are creepy. 50% of those actually do not know how to disable data on data collection. So they have the devices, they can't disable data, and that's half field. And there is a percentage of 28% of people that would never apparently buy an Internet of Things device because they are more or less as fearful of the security concerns. So this is what is what we are dealing with in an industrial society. And so uh, I know that this research is quite extensive and it's not possible and not giving it fair uh, time to go through all the details, but I re recommend that you look into this and realize that these are um, a small, con a major, uh, say, reason to be concerned about the future of the Internet of Things, mainly because we are, temper we are trying to communicate with a perception Mm. Not necessarily an accurate perception, I mean something that reflects reality, but there is a strong negative perception of the Internet of Things. And while this does not necessarily uh, show that they are bad or good, it does reflect on partly on what the individuals or consumers think based, in my opinion, as a person who's been working in the journalism field and uh, study uh, aspects of media, the portrayal of the stories that we've heard earlier uh, from my colleague on the various uh, hacking attempts and the vulnerabilities and the cases where an, a, sp a simple webcam can actually lead to disrupting services for millions of people, as happened uh, in the East Coast a few years ago, this all piles up and creates an illusion, let's say, a perception that is negative. And so part of the problem deals with the reality that there are cases, maybe inflated cases, but there are cases that cause concern for the uh, consumers. And, and what is interesting about this information as well is that there is lack of awareness of how to deal with these devices. So it reflects on the difficulty to, for you as a user to understand how the manual works, or let's say how you read the manual, how you interact with the device, what are the options for you to get rid of the risks or reduce the risks? So apparently it has to do with the way you read the instructions and understand them, or sometimes not read the instructions and understand them. And so the idea here is to look into this from a purely consumer angle and look into it that this could help us as people involved in the internet, trust in the internet, to build on smart solution smart or connect smart campaigns that raise awareness about how do you not only use the internet of things in a proper way but also utilize the data functionality of it make sure that you know exactly what is it that you can allow to be collected and what is it that you cannot so uh, in uh, to conclude uh, the idea here is to 
not, not only uh, consider the uh, physical and manufacturer related aspects of the internet of things that's also very crucial and uh, and uh, rudimentary and uh, uh, important but the also and to also understand how is it that users interact with these devices mm -hmm. and this is a bit of a, maybe a reflection on to microsoft that produces these devices and is it possible that you look into ways in which you can interact more openly and and directly with consumers and consider their fears and worries and, and understand the implications of that on your product as well as other Internet of Things devices. Simply because in, a, in today's digital age, Internet of Things devices are not standalone devices. They are interconnected. So it means that the weakest link would probably be something not produced by Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something that's less let's say prevalent and let's say less visible, but might be the one single problem that would cause huge security vulnerabilities. Apparently not only to one household, maybe to other households that are connected and even to computers that are connected across the world. So it does show us that it's important to look into the user's perspective on this. And I'd like that to be my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Walid. Could you please uh, repeat the name of the study and where people can find it? Yes. So uh, if you go to the internetsociety.org, a simple search of the trust opportunity, exploring consumer attitudes of the internet, to the Internet of Things. This is a study that has been done this year, May, and uh, it's uh, quite extensive. I recommend you check it out. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, in, in our product reviews uh, at Mozilla, in our annual guide, um, which is called Privacy Not Included, we have something called a creepo creepometer where readers can rate themselves whether they find a device creepy or not based on the information available about it. Um, so, for instance, the privacy policy of the company, um, whether the data is encrypted, these kinds of, of things, like similar to what you mentioned um, in terms of what makes a device secure. And there's a question at the end um, on the website where it says, would you buy this product? And many times people say, yes, they will buy products even when they find them creepy. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that's also mirrored in, in your study, in the one that you mentioned. Absolute, yeah, absolutely. And one thing that is uh, more important for us to recognize that if there are any even simple vulnerabilities that have been discovered very recently, for example, after the the actual device has been produced and uh, sold, then it's a major responsibility for all these layers, both the regulators, the manufacturers, and the retailers to warn mm -hmm. consumers. Because occasionally they get you know, away with having something like this in the hands of children, in the hands of families, in the hands of individuals might, that might lead to consequences that are catastrophic. And so where in the process does one intervene and how? That's a very good you know, I think, uh, headway to a discussion of how is it that we can look into the internet governance aspect of this. I think we've, we've covered some on security, we've talked about privacy. I think many times in these conversations the words privacy and security are conflated a bit um, or used interchangeably. Do you see any connection between the two? Because you were talking a lot about security. Are more private devices, in terms of uh, what data is collected or shared with others, are they also more secure? Where do the two meet, in your view? Yeah, that's a great question. I think they're, in many cases, the same. In some cases, they're a bit different. I think security should be at a minimum standard in terms of what consumers should expect when they buy a device, whether they find it creepy or not, or whether they know at great detail what the device includes from a feature perspective. Someone like my mom, for example, I wouldn't expect her to read the seven properties paper and then take that and go to a German retailer and make an informed decision about which fridge to buy mm -hmm. um, based on the security features that, uh, it has. Um, I think one of the big challenges is that consumers, frankly, just don't have any information about the security of the devices. And I think, or we think that having more information out there about giving the consumers the tools to make a better informed decision based on the security that is out there is, is very crucial. Um, but I think security in many ways can help protect privacy, let's say, um, using a more secure encryption to communicate the 
communication between devices. And there have been cases in the United States, for example, where the Federal Trade Commission has actually settled with the manufacturers of devices um, based on false claims they've made about the, both the security and the privacy of the devices. So, so I think, to sum up, both security and privacy are very important and in some ways intersect, but both should Consumers should expect a minute to meet a minimum bar for both security and privacy. Mm -hmm. I would like to welcome people from the audience. If anybody has questions for either of our two first speakers, you're welcome to stand up. Uh, hi. Uh, what uh, on some in some circles it has been proposed uh, that manufacturers actually print something like a best before date uh, date where they uh, give, we will provide updates and uh, software updates until to, uh, up to that date. And some even more radical voices, one would say, uh, have argued that after, uh, past that date, the, the, the manufacturer should be uh, obliged to, um, to provide the tools and the, and the means for the people that have bought that software to, uh, to that device to actually update the software themselves to patch it and thus uh, um, transferring the, the software to the, um, to the open source domain. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, just like, I mean, uh, thinking of it from a consumer perspective, let's say they are a device. First of all, again, whether it's online or offline, a device will have to be, you know, sec secure. It has to be, you know, uh, very well prepared in terms of instructions of how to use it, etc. And it's generally a consumer protection act. The only difference here, major difference, let's say, is that no longer is it only confined to this environment. Now it is connected, sometimes to a network, sometimes to the world. So based on, a, it might be connected to a cloud service, for example. So in, in this case, there are two major layers of where I think is, is uh, important to look into. The first is the consumer himself or herself. Has the consumer the awareness of what is it that he or she is dealing with, this particular device? Do they get the information when they you know, buy it? Are they, um, when they get their views, for example, they sometimes look into Amazon.com and look into that, and is that sufficient, or is there something more to be done before the purchase happens? The second thing is, once the purchase is concluded, how do you do uh, when you have uh, concerns? Is it enough to simply look into the data, to the manual, or is it possible to communicate directly through the web? with the manufacturer, or is, it, is there a certain support unit that needs to be allocated, particularly for things that might change the firmware very rapidly? Mm -hmm. So there are things that are pre-sale and after-sale, just like any other device, just that making sure that they are aware of these possibilities, that's one thing. Another aspect is obviously to the other side, I mean the manufacturer in this case. Uh, an expiry date would look feasible in cases where there is supposedly updates to the firmware or routine updates to the way the device would work. In a live environment like the internet, it's difficult to imagine something being static. It's constantly changing. There are different protocols. Sometimes the protocols are in the code which actually need to be updated. So if you're offline and for a particular period in time and there were bugs that were discovered and then fixed and patched, but you do not update the firmware in time, then you already may have you know, caused damage. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very complicated in the sense that how many uh, layers should be you add, but I would strongly believe that it's a two-side uh, process, both the consumer side needs to be aware more, and that's why the campaign that's lost by um, Consumer International called Connect Smart Tips, it's very useful if you are willing to buy an IoT to look into it. And then there's on the other side, the industrial manufacturers and retailers. Um, the third side is the governments, and I know that we have a colleague from the government as, as well, so later on we can discuss that too. But yes, it's uh, multi-dimensional, multifaceted, and that's how it ought to be, yes. I, I like that question a lot because it does point, it points to the technology itself being part of the solution and how we think about how to design things, how to program things, and how to connect them to one another. It's all part of 
uh, dealing, I think, with both threats and opportunities, and why it's so difficult for a lot of people to think about what can be done, because it is at so many levels, both in the home and in public space, public bathrooms, as you mentioned. Um, I would like to go to our next, next speaker today. Oh, we have a question online, it seems. Um, one more question. Hello, people watching on the internet. Hello, uh, there is one question from Benjamin Akimoyeje from Namibia to everyone at the panelists. Uh, the question is just to play the devil advocates with the internet generation slash consumer uh, that are obsessed with the sharing. How far is cybersecurity or privacy viable on this ex uh, uh, activation, sharing everything online in internet by the young generation? So, is there a youth a youth aspect to this question? Is the the trend towards sharing personal information online? How does that connect to this issue? That's how I understood the question. Is that a fair interpretation? Okay, hi. hi, I'm Merit and Data Protection Commissioner and of course we get those questions all day and uh, we see that many of the young or old or whatever uh, um, aspect of our society is represented, community, they have context specific needs to share or or not to share or to hide some information. So even kids hide some information, but of course it's always the question, who is your adversary? And it may be your parents, it may be your teachers, and then they're very good at hiding those. And about disclosure, automatic disclosure must not happen, but if you want to share, um, this is part of our social activities that is not necessarily something bad. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, mandatory sharing, this would not be the right default for many of those occasions. And think of a smart home. If every smart home device posts everything which is happening inside uh, on a website, I think everybody agrees this is, should not be the default. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we have not yet had a chance to discuss business models surrounding IoT um, or the, the general, I think, ecosystem and trend of, of data and data sharing. Um, let's see if we get to it later, soon. I'd like to introduce Lily, uh, Lily Botsoye from Ghana, um, who's representing GCNet. And there's a presentation too. Hello everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Lily Edina Mboche from Ghana and I represent the Ghana Community Network Services Limited. I also coordinate the Ghana Youth IGF and I'm excited to be here. I think the panel wanted a, a youth perspective to issues regarding IoT and cybersecurity and that's why I'm on it and I'm excited to actually, actually represent youth because we conducted something uh, based on IoT awareness in March this year and I'll share with you what we came out with to actually sensitize people on IoT and its awareness. So my first slide says, the future is exciting. And the question is, are you ready? Just put up your hand. The future is exciting, are you ready? The future is exciting, are you ready? Okay, so yesterday I walked through the exhibition booth and I found something quite interesting. There was a booth that had the internet of humans. And so out of curiosity, I passed by to ask what it meant. And what they told me was that the internet, what the internet of humans seeks to do is actually to put humans at the center of everything, uh, tech and IoT and every emerging technology. So gathering the perspectives of humans and using what they've gathered to actually build technology that uh, is for humans. And I think that's a step toward um, human-centered and secured IoT devices. So I am here to actually give a, a bit, say, talk a bit about the best practices from the consumer perspective, also mentioning um, 
what manufacturers can do, and government and all. And I'm excited because the, the tone and the floor has already been set with what we can do. Now, um, we, we already know that there's an increase in the number of devices connected. And when there's increased interconnectivity and the communication between devices, there's also a greater risk of cyber threats and um, attacks. Because while well, information and data is being communicated and over a network, and you may not know who is looking and who wants to intercept the information and for what reason. So the IIT, as we've already gathered, is given everyday uh, items an ability to share data and for a particular purpose. And I'll go on to share with you on what IoT actually is used for on a broader scale. So we have IoT um, used for industry-specific activities. An example is where you have the health institutions having data of um, patients run through in real time on IoT devices and being connected over a network to a doctor who, who maybe needs the information, or even serving underserved or under-resourced places in places like Africa, where I come from, and more. And when we go into the places that are underserved and under-resourced, we want to even go into um, connectivity and inclusion and all the other infrastructure that comes with being connected. Then we come on to look at the consumer bit to IoT, the wearables, the fitness trackers, the smart fridges, the smart uh, phones, and more. Everything smart in your home, everything that can actually give you information or communicate some data to you in your home. And so that's the angle we are going to take um, the, security, uh, the security issue from. So some problems of IoT, I just made it very blank because there's more to it than what can be on the slide. So when we talk about privacy, that's more of um, guiding um, a, a user's identity or information that a user feels is sensitive and wants to keep to himself or herself and wants to have it uh, private, wants to seclude that from everybody. So because you have data actually flooding and um, the, communication, the communication is ongoing, you may not know um, to what extent your data is being shared online. Like we have you signing up for to be on a social media platform, they ask for your credentials. And maybe, let's say, that the, the only normal thing you should see on somebody's uh, social media platform should be, say, uh, email address, name, and maybe, uh, yeah, just that. And maybe the person shared the location and where they live and all that is out there. They'll be asking, how far is too far? And like the question that just came before I took the podium, the person asked that, what can we say about youth actually sharing information in this day and time? And it comes back to say that um, if you don't want the information out there, you don't put it there. And we all heard that uh, want is out there, the risk of it actually getting into the hands of bad people, hackers, and how it's susceptible to being uh, prone or susceptible to attacks is high when it's out there. So it's a conscious effort, what you want out there, and you've been intentional about the activity online. Because um, there's this popular thing that we all see, the internet never forgets. And we, on, the, on, the, on the slide I just moved from, there was the issue also of security. So security now also got, comes to deal with uh, how secured your data is. So if they're taking your data for something, what is it being used for? What, um, who, who sees it? Where is it going to? I remember at the IGF last year, there's a whole session that was actually prolonged because of how interesting it was. And it was on the issue of algorithmic transparency and the right to explanation. I already want to start the debate here, but people had or wanted to know what exactly it is that tells Facebook that I was in this place with this person, and so you should send me that friend's suggestion. And maybe probably my location was on, the person's location was on, and so the communication gets to that point of me being uh, suggested to, to ask somebody of a friend by, by the mere fact that we're in the same location. So you're also looking at how secured um, your data is, who, how, how is it being safeguarded. And also look at, there's another one on the slide that says uh, loopholes in regulatory uh, frameworks. So in my part of the world, it's, it's, um, IoT is also part of emerging technologies where 
um, we are all trying to um, grow with it and come to adapt. Yesterday, we heard the UN Secretary General say something that I thought was profound. He said the growth of technology and uh, all these, um, yeah, the growth of technology seriously outpaces the rate at which we're able to set policies to match up with them. So you can, you can be seeing how, how things are changing fast and how we, we, we are building up to actually regulate them. We can't catch up with it, but as and when uh, they're, they're out there, there are supposed to be things that are checking it before it gets out of hand. And uh, Mr. Wahid actually made me reset a paper I had already taken in my room. So this was, uh, this was the statistics he gave us early on. He asked us how many people thought regulators should be those uh, responsible for the, the security uh, of IoT and the answers they came forth. So this is what um, people had to say. And me for one actually believes that it's a shared responsibility. It's a shared responsibility. So the manufacturer can actually put or go by privacy by design and, and, and put privacy in every step of the way, adding human values um, to how the thing is built, and even go a step further. That, that's because, well, it adds that because they've taught through um, um, privacy and security and are consciously adding to it, not making it look like it was an afterthought. So everything is carefully, carefully planned. The, the, the IoT devices out there, and then we have maybe the play of uh, privacy by default, where um, there are some strict there are some strict things that actually come to play without uh, necessary human input. Then we go to where we have say retailers also selling to you; they've done their bit, uh, maybe um, playing by high standards and working with you and giving you what you desire. Then we have, um, let's say if you're in an organization and you're buying this, these IoT devices in your organization, you set up firewalls and are updating all those stuff. And then we come to the user bit, we the consumers. Um, Mr. Wahid also said that, and I think it's also profound that in every system, the weakest link is a human. So once you have all this in play, a little breach on one device can lead to a whole disruption over the cloud. And there are many, many, many such examples where we have even well-established um, organizations which have products out there getting attacked. And that's not because they didn't probably play their role well, a little breach by somebody sitting somewhere. And so I just mentioned the roles we all have to play. And the, my, other, my other task is to share briefly what best practices there are, especially from a personal or a consumer perspective. So everybody can actually keep that in mind and stay safe while using IoT because the possibility in IoT is massive. And that's why I asked that the future is exciting and are you ready? Yeah. So I, I mentioned early on that a couple of my friends and I from the Youth IGF 2018 joined the world in celebrating World um, Consumer Rights Day by taking to Twitter and using some hashtags to actually educate people on how to stay safe while using IoT devices and the very little things you can do in an all small way to keep you safe. So I'll share a couple of what you did online and I'm glad that some of the people who did this are also in this room to witness. Okay, so the first one, don't connect your devices unless you need to. And I learned this when I was taking my model for IGF last year. They said you should use the internet or technology as a tool and not just a space. So if you want to trim the hedges in your house, you would go for something proper for trimming hedges. You wouldn't go for a scissors. That's a pair of scissors, that's a lot of work. So as and when you need your, your devices to do something, say maybe you want to order an Uber, your location should be on. Otherwise, there's really no need if you're not in the moment sharing your location with anybody or using the, your location for anything. You don't know who is collecting the data or what can be done in the background, tracing where you've been, the movement and everything. So another, another part could be even um, certain policies, especially if you're in, a, in an organization um, that guards plug and play. So once nobody puts uh, a device in any computer and is able to quickly um, work with it, there should be policies at every step that says that, okay, this is what we are allowing and this is what is not going to be allowed at this step and the next. And create a separate network for guests. So this, this is just one of the 
things we should actually take note of in organizations in your homes so that people, you don't get, give people access into your network because once they are in, that's where they can sit to perpetrate any other thing they want to do. So you can create a very separate one for guests in, in your home, in the office, so that you are on very, very different uh, networks of playing grounds with people who visit you. And this cannot be hammered enough, actually. And I'm very guilty. I, I can't, for the life of me, envision the number of passwords I would have to set if I was very, relig if I was very committed to certain new passwords. But it's what should be done. Um, you pick good passwords and you try to set different passwords for every device. It may be hard, um, and now Google has uh, a way of remembering passwords. I have reservations. I, I don't know how to explain it, but some part of me thinks that um, I don't know whether it can be shared because you are saving the device, uh, you are saving the password for later. You could just come in and log on. But the, the right way to go is if you can pick good ones, remember, and they are very, very different ones that you can pick every other time for every device. Then I mentioned this already, turn, turn off uh, universal plug and play vulnerabilities on the system. Yeah, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you just have somebody being able to connect to your, um, your Wi-Fi, well, not just Wi-Fi, your port, the USB port, uh, the information that is, sh that is being shared, you don't know uh, what has been even monitored while they are on. And we said, make sure you have the latest firmware, and also remember to update software. So um, this one, we, we, from my part of the world, we normally, we normally see the alerts. Uh, you can actually, I've scheduled a lot of um, software updates, and I literally have to do something about it because I feel it's going too far. But we, 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 we sit and do not so much till there's an issue. Then everybody runs around and trying to fix what went wrong. But if you're able to be proactive, to even go ahead of time to set all these um, updates, um, even set reminders for them, we may be on a good way of harnessing the benefits of IoT and ripping in the immense, uh, immense um, benefits that it has, especially moving forward in the future where everything is moving from manual to digital and in the revolution where we are, which is the fourth industrial revolution. So keep personal devices out of the workplace and protect each area of your life. And that's um, a, a safe clue. And so we know all these, and that's basically what I came to share um, from the best practices, uh, um, the, personal, the personal initiatives you can do, you can take to stay safe online. And yet again, I'll ask the question, the future is exciting. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, so that's fine, thank you. Our next speaker, thank you, Lily. Our next speaker is Wahyuri Jafar from Indonesia, representing ELSAM. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to thank for this opportunity. I just shared the uh, uh, experience uh, and the coalition about the, how uh, uh, the use of the IoT uh, in the of thing in Indonesia, especially related to the issue of the data security and the data privacy in the uh, uh, what is in the use of the uh, IoT. Uh, I will begin uh, with the update of the uh, current situation in digitalization in Indonesia and how far on the aspect of uh, the issue of the IoT. Uh, as you know, uh, Indonesian government has just finalized the infrastructure project of Palaparing Network, which will connect the entire parts of the country from the west uh, to the east uh, with the three platform. Uh, the completion of the Palaparing infrastructure is expected to bring a significant impact uh, for the growth of the internet users in Indonesia, as well as uh, the development of the new internet-based platform, including uh, IoT. It is the, stated by the government. Uh, and uh, for the information, until 2019, the data from Indonesian Internet Service Providers Association shows that at least uh, 170 uh, 71 million out of the 
267 million people in Indonesia have been connected with the internet. So it is the biggest market for the IoT platform. But the research from the Asia IoT business platform records that the adoption of devices with use of the internet of things platform until early of 2019 by Indonesian company is still less than 10%. So it is the opportunity. Uh, and the last, uh, the government in its 2020 until 2024 mid-development planning has placed the digital transformation mainstreaming as one of its main priorities, which become the basis of the development of digital-based uh, economy and the public services improvement. So uh, for five uh, next years, the Indonesian government have the priority how to digitalizing all of the public services and also uh, how the uh, digital uh, can support of the, uh, the vision about the digital economy. And uh, how about the use of the IoT? So far, uh, the use of IoT in Indonesia can at least be uh, detected from the development of a number of uh, digital infrastructure in several sectors. Uh, for example, agriculture uh, related to the prediction of uh, harvest and option of the fertilizers. And the second, the uh, sector of fishery for the automatic fish feeding and the development of smart city and smart living. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, the government launched uh, the program uh, 100 smart city and uh, for five years, and other than that, there is a development of that IoT platform by industry in order to automate the manufacture and develop an automatic decision and expand uh, their marketing. And particularly related to the development of smart city, uh, the cities in Indonesia usually develop the IoT platform from the traffic management, pollution control, and criminal prevention. Uh, as a consequently, it becomes a trend in the entire city to install CCTV cameras in order to monitor the activities of the citizen in real time. For example, in Jakarta, we have more than uh, 7,000 CCTV cameras, and which most of them are equipped by the face recognition technology, whose uh, platform is integrated with the population database system. So the police can uh, catch up the people if they uh, conduct a criminal, because the CCTV cameras, it is integrated with the uh, database uh, population system. So the police can identify uh, who are the name, uh, the number of the uh, identity, and where is the address. Uh, and what's about the challenge of the IoT uh, in Indonesia? In, in general, the use of IoT in Indonesia deals with at least three major challenges. The first, regulation, uh, the second, infrastructure, and third, uh, human resource. Other than that, the challenge is related to guarantee of privacy and data protection and data security from the public also as a concern. And in the context of the regulation, Indonesian government identifies that at least through that uh, there are three problems of the level of the regulation. Uh, the first, uh, the issue about the frequency standard uh, in the uh, use of the IoT, uh, second of the devices standardization, and the third, the level of local content requirement of the technology. So far, the Indonesian government has only responded by passing the Ministry of Communication and Informatic Regulation to regulate the use of frequency, which also includes of IoT. So uh, the last uh, Ministry regulation in this year uh, responded by the uh, IoT product to spread uh, their uh, products, especially to the local government. Uh, Manuel, related to the infrastructure, the government states that the connecting of palabaring will overcome the infrastructure problems. And the main challenge of the IoT is actually in the vulnerability of collected data privacy and data security. Uh, considering that until today, Indonesian government has not had a comprehensive data protection law, as well as a sufficient cyber security law. Uh, referring to the report of National Cyber and Inscription Body, during uh, 2018, there have been at least 200 uh, 32 million cyber attack incident in Indonesia, in which uh, 
one million twenty two uh, twenty uh, two thousand of the war malware attacks. Other than that, there are several times of personal data leaks, especially involving a number of digital startups company. It remains as as accusation as the comprehensive and truck investigation have never been conducted because there is no law to give the mandate to the governor or other uh, institution to conduct of the investigation. And what is the vulnerability in the data privacy and the data security? Uh, Basically, the main problem that Indonesia deal with to balance with the development pace of technology innovation is the legal uncertainty to ensure the guarantee of protection in data privacy and data security. Indonesia at least has 32 sectoral laws related to data privacy, but their materials are contradictory and overlapping one another. It is based on our research in LSAM. And consequently, there is no certainty and guarantee data privacy protection. Besides, high ego sectoralism among the government institution also implicates to the uncertainty of the oversight of data protection. So that if there is a suspected leak and abuse, no sufficient investigation is conducted, including the remedy of the victims. Uh, in the recent, uh, governments currently uh, attempts to finalize the process of personal data protection bill formulation to be discussed by House of Representatives in the coming 2020, and the bill uh, mostly adopting of the uh, principles and the materials from EU GDPR. Uh, mine will, uh, due to the cybersecurity context, the main problem is the unclear role and job division among institutions which are responsible for guaranteeing cybersecurity. The large number of involved institutions with the unclear role division and the contrary creates the vulnerability in the cybersecurity because uh, most of the state institution take the responsibility to handle of the problem and challenge of the cyber security. And there is no unclear uh, definition or and the rule of the institution. Uh, House of Representatives has tried to propose the initiative of the liberation of cyber security and resilience bill, but rejected by the public as the substances are too state-centric and do not accommodate the multi-stakeholder approach and tend to, to be used as the control instrument against the citizen lives. The government try to monitor all of the internet traffic and the data traffic, so the public uh, refuse of the initiative from the parliament. And the problem of law and the regulation above become more complicated with the lack of awareness and knowledge of the public and the government apparatus uh, to ensure the data security and privacy. The literacy of the information, especially related to the data security and privacy, undeniable becomes one of the biggest challenges for Indonesia. I mean, the acceleration of internet users of growth. And uh, as a, a conclusion, as a closure, responding to these challenges in the future, it needs to develop the policy and regulation which seriously consider human rights aspect to guarantee the individual security protocol, devices, data in the network. Uh, human must be placed as the center of debate as the mayor of the victims of cyber attack or data exploitation are human, not a machine or not a state. Uh, human rights-based approach enables to base on human-centric for the development which is beyond the geographical and the political borders. And last but not least, uh, specific for Indonesia, we need uh, immediate initiative to deliberate a law which specifically stipulated the provision of personal data protection pursuant to the personal data protection principles and international human rights life standard. And we hope in the next year we have the data protection law, the comprehensive data protection law, and also the cyber security. Because uh, we need to uh, protect our privacy and our uh, digital security. Uh, in the situation, the government have the priority to conduct uh, or transforming uh, digital. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, well, you did, I, I wonder if you, for context, you didn't mention what ELSAM does. Could you mention what, what the organization is? I'm assuming from your passion you might be a civil society actor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, basically ELSAM, the Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy, is uh, the human rights organization focused in the digital rights. And uh, we develop of the model of multi-stakeholder approach in Indonesia with the government and also the private sector to discuss and deliberating the uh, draft of bill or regulation to minimize of the risk uh, of the uh, law and regulation because uh, in the past uh, experience, if the government and the parliament uh, worry, uh, deliberation of the law and deliberation of the bill, it is mostly complicated and give the big, uh, have the high rise to the civil society, uh, especially in this issue of freedom of expression and the uh, right to privacy. Thank you very much. I think your, your situation is one that many people in different countries will recognize of uh, governments and also manufacturers and service providers pushing forward before necessary data protection legislation is in place to properly secure humans. Um, one country which is perhaps a bit further down the line of discussing at least data privacy is Germany, um, where we are now. Um, our next speaker is Marit Hansen. Um, and she has a presentation for us. She's uh, the chief of independent uh, Center for Data Protection in Germany. Yes, thank you very much. I'm the Data Protection Commissioner of Schleswig-Holstein. We have a federal system in Germany, so we are, this is the, the northernmost uh, state. And um, if we are lucky, we will see in a minute even where it's situated. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what this presentation is about, <laughs> but at least you see ULD is our, has a very long German term, Unabhängiges Landeszentrum für Datenschutz Schleswig-Holstein, and it doesn't seem to work. And I cannot do anything. Does that work? Should we, should we, should we continue? Ah, ah, we, we, oh. can, we can see it oh, here. We can see it. Very good, very good. Okay, so the northern, northernmost, okay, thank you, but uh, unfortunately not, the, the text is missing on the slides now. So uh, interesting. Should, some, some pieces are missing. Um, doesn't matter, um, the, the presentation will be online afterwards and I will try to jump to only the very in interesting parts. I'm the regulator, mm -hmm. I'm one of many, many, many regulators uh, in Europe and uh, especially in Germany in the northernmost part. You see here uh, Berlin is far east and south. And um, I want to talk about something where where you see some images and no text. And um, this is a normal situation. There are many people and there, there's data processing in the fog. You don't know what is happening. There are very big and tall buildings and it's a really a question of imbalance in power. And this is the main motivation for data protection and also very often for privacy reasons. And therefore, our main idea is not security of assets, but the perspective of the individual. And uh, one thing which is now very much debated is the GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, regulation, and uh, there, there's a sentence about the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons and um, the protection of personal data. And uh, yeah, there you see all the rights that are now uh, not seen. Uh, for example, it's also about non-discrimination. It's a protection of personal data. It's about freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and everything uh, is part of the rights and freedoms on the European level. Let's hope for the best that we see some, something later on. Hmm. 
By the way, the, the universal format uh, that was demanded is JPEG. And ah, okay, at least we see here something later on, and I think that's all right. Um, how to implement it now? We've heard about security. We heard about confidentiality, integrity, availability. These are typical security protection goals. And here we see that there are some, some more things to consider. For example, unlinkability to separate those parts, those contacts that should be separated. And uh, therefore, um, unlinkability is often not considered. It's the other way around. Very often, what is, what is uh, disclosed is linked Link, linkable to the human being and to the other data sets that are existing. For example, what we heard about the facial recognition, which is immediately recognizable. So unlinkability is to separate. And also, this is a question of the separation of power, which is a necessary thing, I think, in democratic societies. And this should be reflected by technology as well. The other thing which is um, very often lacking on the right side here is transparency. The, the way of something where we can understand what is happening. And we heard already from the statistics that very often people are not aware of what is happening. And this is one reason for the feeling that something is creepy. So if it's not to be understood, it's hidden, uh, you cannot find out, you don't understand, even if you read the protection, uh, the privacy uh, policies, then uh, obviously we have some, some difficulties. But especially with IoT and uh, again with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it, it poses new questions. And the third thing is intervenability on the uh, left side here again, uh, when we heard about deactivating IoT sensors. This is something which is, is not taken for granted. Very often, it's not clear how to deactivate something. And sometimes uh, manufacturers or providers of services do not offer to deactivate what is happening. So this is something to intervene, to change something, especially in the case of, of uh, mistakes. But also, if I, I don't want to be observed, if I want to shut down my smart home, for example, this should be possible. Let's try again. Ah, now we see that uh, some slides are better than others. But I don't want to discuss so much with you on that. It's always a question who is on, in control. But sometimes it's even necessary for state, for states, for example, for smart cities to profit from, from the data. That, that it's not, not an option to deactivate everything, of course, provided that the data protection rights, the other rights, are um, guaranteed. So otherwise, if everybody is asked first, I don't think that it's possible that all sensors ask ourselves and, and uh, we have to react on everything. On the other hand, sometimes it's necessary, for example, uh, if you want an, an overview of uh, what is happening in the, in the world, it can be part of some statistics, some aggregated information, but you should really uh, think of is it possible to deactivate or not? And if not, how are the rights protected? It must not be usually personal data, or it has to be guaranteed that there's sufficient protection. OK. And now, something I think uh, we haven't seen before is it is not the technology issue. I'm a computer scientist myself, but we have more social issues, societal issues with, with IoT. And we see, meanwhile, many cases of kids going with smart watches to their classrooms, uh, not because they are so smart not because they want to have a look and uh, profit from the technology and uh, look up uh, some, some internet uh, sites or so. No, because their parents want to activate voice control and trying to listen in how the teachers treat their kids. So this is a new effect, that people have a smart watch and they are used as a vehicle to, 
to uh, establish some, some control from the side of parents because they want to protect their kids. The kids are uh, tracked by GPS, but also the, the, the teachers of the other kids are monitored because uh, they might not treat uh, the kid well enough. And then the, the parent can jump in and say, oh, teacher, don't do that again. Be a little bit nicer to my kid. Uh, in my area, we take, uh, so if we are asked as a regulator, we have to answer, no, the, the, the classroom, um, if the teachers don't want to be observed, if the other kids, of course, don't want to be observed, uh, the, the, this should not be the standard, and so the smart watches are removed beforehand. The same is happening now with uh, caregivers. Also, the family is so... Um, well, they are, they are very, perhaps not, not, not visiting often enough. They want to make sure that the, that the caregivers treat the, the patients in the right way. And also they are monitoring what is happening with their family members who are uh, patient in, in this um, hospital, for example. Of course, similar technologies are also used by employers. So we see that the monitoring and observing facilities are also used and, that's, and, and people uh, take it for granted that that's their right because they have to predict, pr protect their kids or the grandma. So this, this should happen then that way. And I think there are new ways where we have negotiated the rules of living together. And um, this is another thing um, where we see that a smart home may not only be attacked by outsiders, as we heard in the first talk by Benedict, so the, the bad actors from the outside. It may be the administrator, which may be your wife, which may be your husband, which may be the parents or the kids. They are administering the, the smart home and they may, for example, control the heating, the lighting and the blinds in a way they like and not you like. Or they uh, want to, to uh, shut down the doors so, so that, that you must not go inside anymore. Uh, or um, perhaps that others are uh, invited uh, to, to come in and you cannot close them anymore. So that this, this may be also a question of power imbalance. It's not something the data protection regulators usually jump in because there's no organization treating the personal data or the census in a wrong way. But this is a power play which is very often happening with um, uh, stalking and other victim cases. And we must not forget that even if security is very high, the administrator can control something. What about then the transparency and the intervenability of the victims, of the others? It's not solved yet. Okay, coming back to the, the, the slides now, my conclusion is we have so many opportunities in building better technologies, data protection by design, and by default is meanwhile demanded by the general data protection regulation, which has the same setting in, uh, throughout Europe. So this is, I think, a good thing. But very often it's not addressing the manufacturers, it's addressing the controllers. So only very, very, uh, uh, only those who are, who are using the data for their, their purposes. And the liability discussion has not been uh, finalized yet. And also, uh, there are, I think, not uh, the right incentives for, for improving the situation. It's a little bit, we, we, if, if a breach is happening, everybody is promising now this won't happen again, and next day we have the next breach. So I believe that it could be done better. Right now, it's not only teething troubles that in one year time everything will be solved. We need better incentives. And let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've heard about security, we've heard about privacy, we've heard about surveillance. Um, here to give an African perspective on IoT and law enforcement is Michael Ilishebo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know we are tired. This could be the last, this could be the last session of the day. Mm -hmm. So I'll try at all costs to be very brief. I've set my time at five minutes. Let me see if I can beat my clock. Uh, so basically, uh, my name's uh, Michael Irishevo. I work for Zambia Police. I am a digital forensic analyst. I also investigate cybercrime. Uh, basically, if you look at IoT 
the Internet of Things and law enforcement landscape now to an extent where you have to imagine to compare the two sides of the coin from the European perspective and to the African perspective. To the European perspective, it has been a great tool in terms of enforcing the law. It's like everything has been done on behalf of the law enforcers. Information is easily acquired, evidence is everywhere. But in this case, if you look at it from the African perspective, it has not been an easy journey. Uh, basically, if you look at it, you start with our laws. IoT is a technology that actually interconnects many devices to the internet. This simply means that if you are investigating a crime, uh, you're looking for evidence. Most of the evidence in these IoT devices, most of them are crowd-based. Because most of these IoT devices, they, have, they don't have that huge memory to store most of this information. As a result, they keep the information in the crowd. So that in itself has posed a great challenge for us back home. Let's, talk, let's take an issue of an, a self-autonomous car. You know, a Tesla, like a self-driven car. I can imagine that if I was to go back home with a self-driven car and I allow it to drive throughout town center, without a driver. I don't know how people look at it because we are used to seeing a car with a person driving it. <laughs> I can imagine that that car passes through a police checkpoint. There are traffic officers. They see a car which is coming, but there's no human being in it. What happens? Anyone who can help me? <laughs> what happens? You are in Africa. You see a car coming. You are on duty as a police officer. You see a car coming and there's no driver in it and he stops seeing you because it's, it's, been able to, it's, it's been programmed to identify a police officer, it's been a, 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 an obstacle that stands in between it. So basically in itself that is a challenge. Suppose that car, in peradventure it is involved in a road accident, who do you charge? So basically when we talk of IOTs, despite the technology having already penetrated the African market, the laws governing the management of IoT in terms of digital evidence acquisition is not there in most African countries. You have the evidence, but which statutes, which laws are you going to use to have that law, that evidence admitted in the courts of law? So basically, in as much as we are trying to embrace IoT, we also need to come up with legislation that allows us to coexist with either artificial intelligent uh, machines, IoT devices, and any other technology that will come on the market. Put it this way, in an ordinary law enforcement officer in Africa, the nearest device they've been to in terms of, they've come across in terms of uh, internet of things is either a smartwatch or even a mobile device. Many people have smart TVs but those smart TVs don't have internet connections. Mm. People now are buying Google Home devices, but because of the price uh, caps in terms of data usage and the, the price in terms of internet, those things are as good as not being smart. Something can only be smart if it has access to the internet. So basically, from the law enforcement perspective, it has become, it has proved itself to be a very serious challenge when you, for example, you are given a device, a Google or an Amazon Echo Dot to extract evidence from. The Amazon Dot, Echo Dot has no actual big memory on it for you, to, for you to extract whatever it was able to hear in the background, meaning that you really have to go to the account of the owner. Uh, the actual, uh, is it uh, iTunes or what? Is it? It's, yeah, whatever account or the Google account if you are using a, a Google Mini Home. So basically, just an introduction to IoT in itself on the African continent has proved and provided a very serious challenge in the way we, we investigate cases and fight cases. This time around, we're talking of artificial intelligence. Uh, web cameras that are able to do uh, facial, co facial cognitions. You may have that camera, but do you have the necessary law that actually governs on how that data that you are collecting is able to be used? 
are you able to admit that evidence or that data that you've acquired in the courts of law? That is not the case. So basically, when you look at IoT, let's look at it on both sides of the coin. Let's not look, if you're in Africa, look at it from the African perspective. If you are in Europe, look at it from the European perspective or the West perspective. Thank you. I would like to ask you a follow-up question since your, since your um, presentation was a bit shorter. Um, this this uh, trend that we heard from Indonesia of governments being pushed to move forward with technology, maybe perhaps the law, before the laws are ready or before the infrastructure is ready, is that something that you've experienced as well? Do you think that the push to um, think that these technologies are going to solve everything for detectives or for law enforcement or that the, the pressure to install security cameras in public spaces, do you think that has been a motivating factor? Do you think it's going too fast, I guess is what I'm... Uh, basically, if you are to look, the law is always the afterthought. Technology comes in, you have a problem, you think of a law. So basically, we cannot ignore that the rate at which we are adopting technology is so faster than the way we, we, we come up with registration. So basically, as he has explained in his presentation, it's a common trend. It's not just Indonesia or anywhere else. It's actually everywhere. Because if you don't deploy the technology, you still remain behind. You may have the law, but without the technology, what is the law for? Mm -hmm. So basically, it's as he's, he's put it, most governments are able to push the technology advancement without having the necessary registration to support those uh, innovations. Benedict from Microsoft, I don't suppose that you can imagine a world where manufacturers or service providers from the corporate sector would only sell these technologies uh, to jurisdictions that had strong data privacy protections or laws in place? Well, I think all consumers should be able to benefit from technology, but I also think consumers should be protected. Um, Microsoft isn't elected to govern or decide what the rules should be in that space. Um, and we've come forward on other issues such as facial recognition where we think that if technology, as you said, is being deployed at such a rapid pace and it puts consumers at risk, then democratically le elected leaders should be able to come forward and decide what, where the law should be drawn. And that applies to not just IoT, I think everything in technology that is so invasive. So. I think that governments should be more active in that space. How they do that it should be a process that involves all stakeholders, including industry, but I think that if consumers can be hurt, even physically, such as can happen with IoT, then governments should definitely play a leading role. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, a, a question that typically uh, occurs at the IGF almost every year is that regulators are not well equipped with the knowledge of understanding the technicalities of these machines and these devices. How do you face this, both maybe in a European and an African perspective? Let's try to rephrase your question again. So regulators are, may not have the competence of under, full knowledge of understanding how the technology works, the, you know, behind, um, uh, let's say, behind the scenes or let's say below the hood. I mean, how do you deal with lack of technological understanding by the regulators sometimes? Uh, basically, if you look at the regulations, it, like, I'll give an example of where I come from in Africa, and to be specific, Zambia. If you look of, of regulations, right now, other countries are talking of AI regulations, ethics, and norms. We haven't yet gotten there. But, and yet, some of these devices are coming in the country, not through government. They could be coming in through the private sector. Because mm -hmm. each business entity who wants to deploy a business, and they want to, to say, to reduce on the numbers of workers, they will deploy machines or, or any automation that will actually cut the cost of running business. As a result, in the long run, like in a year or two or so, you have like almost all banks learning without a front end person at the, at the counter. Like you are, just, you are able to transact without uh, uh, physically meeting with another person at, at, the, at the bank counter. So basically, it is such times when the 
devices and the technology has found itself and looted itself in a country, that's when people actually think of coming up with regulations. So basically, for regulators, they do a good job when and if that uh, technology exists and they, they are able to regulate it. But in the absence of that technology, in the absence of the regulation, meaning in the absence of that law that will require you to regulate an activity or a technology, I don't think it's, it's possible. Mm. So basically, you, if you talk of semi-autonomous cars, back home, mm. if I import a car, I pay load tax, which part of the tax comes from the, the gases we produce, like uh, the carbon gas we produce. But if I brought an electric car, am I going to pay carbon tax? Because the laws just ends up at carbon tax. An electric car does not produce carbon tax. So until when we have 10, 20 cars, that's when they will think now, let's add non-carbon producing cars to this law. Marie, I'm sure you have an answer also. I wanted to encourage anybody who has a question in the audience to stand in front of the microphone now, so I know. And perhaps we have some questions online, but I'll, I'll let Marie answer as well. Thank you. I think uh, it's not only a technology versus law aspect, it's uh, something which needs more disciplines and therefore I think IGF is one of the right addresses uh, where, where we get uh, together, where, where meetings are possible. Uh, and it has to be attractive for the other disciplines, for all disciplines to cooperate, to, to work together. It can also be a question of payment, of course, of staff, of security, of, of a job or so. Um, but also to understand each other, which is, I think, the baseline, which is one of the basic problems. So if everybody is, is trained in university or at a, in practical uh, industry uh, jobs or so, um, very often you learn your stuff only. And the same terms, like transparency, for example, are used by so many other disciplines and there's a perfect misunderstanding. And therefore, it, it also, uh, people feel a little bit, I think, discriminated if, if, the, if their ideas are not, not picked up uh, because of a misunderstanding. So, first of all, I think we should understand the problem is not one discipline problem, but many disciplines, and that we should look forward to to have this debate culture, but also, of course, come to solutions and um, come to better solutions than each single discipline can do. For Germany especially, I think um, very often um, the, there's no equality of payment of, or also the, the jobs have different possibilities. Uh, people probably are not looking forward as a regul for, for regulator jobs usually, or if they do, then they don't expect that they are trained in the very um, far front technology jobs, also because they are, of course, not the inventors. And with the innovation parts in industry, in academia, uh, they are often years ahead. But of course, everybody needs to, to bridge to the practice. And I think w w there's one, one um, entity we have not uh, dealt with, also with the questions, the civil rights organizations, the participation of those who are concerned. Mm -hmm. the regulators may uh, try to, uh, to regulate what is in the law, of course. That's their job. But the, the, the law is lacking behind. And sometimes some others have the better the, the feel and, and uh, the ways, the needs to, to change. And I'm not sure how they are right now part of standardization, probably too little. Mm. Yes, we've, we've discussed the role of the consumer as a purchaser of goods, but maybe less as, as a citizen also and somebody who pushes for change in this field. I think we're all used to, in conversations about the internet, this blurring of the lines between the private and the public. And in Marit's presentation, we saw how um, home is, is connected and that that has influence on the family or a child that is connected has influence on the friends or the teachers or other people you're in touch with. Um, I wonder from, from the youth perspective if you see any kind of um, in Ghana if you see any kind of new uh, behavior or socialization of new ways to engage with these technologies in the way that you would uh, expect to take your shoes off when you enter somebody's house. Uh, what is the equivalent when you're talking about IoT and, and smart devices? Thank you. So it's, it's interesting. So what is happening in Ghana and in acceptance of IoT and getting to know how IoT operates is there is an upsurge or or um, 
an increase in the number of communities and open spaces so people can get talking and get to explore these devices together. And I think that's the right way. So we recently launched a Slack community in Accra. Mm -hmm. And we've had two events so far. So we understand that we are catching up with the trends and trying to understand because, well, nobody's going to learn it and come and show us. So we joined these communities like the Slack groups, um, Python Software um, Foundation, and I also did Mozilla Open Leaders. So I did a Mozilla Sprint in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what we do is to meet as young people, try to explore. What is it that's happening elsewhere in the world? Sometimes you even have webinars. So you have people also sharing their knowledge with us. But you see, that's because we have come to understand that um, the information is out there and we've searched out and trying to see how it works for us. But you come typically to the rural areas and you're looking even as connectivity, like uh, my friend from Zambia would say. Mm -hmm. So it, it gets to that, that point. So now the idea is once we are getting, getting the, gathering the information from the cities, then how it actually gets into the rural areas. So somebody sees a flying car and doesn't say it's witchcraft. No, it's pure technology. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? So that's how we are catching up with it um, and still learning. There are many, many resources that we, we look out for, um, especially online for those who are actually um, connected in the cities and trying to also find it. And in the communities, we also do outreaches. So people get to know. So that's the, the, the way we are going about it. Mm -hmm. And with regulations, like you mentioned, um, it's getting, Ghana has a Data Protection Act, very interesting one, um, which, which uh, mandates that anybody who works with anybody, any other person's personal data has to be registered with the agency. So we, they are able to regulate and watch you and what you're doing. But what's beyond that? How do we know if people are actually registering? And how do you know what is it um, by way of data they are collecting? And what is being used for? So once they come out, once the act is there, there's more to be done than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the act is there, people know about it. But beyond that, the GDPR in Ghana comes to play in, in, in companies which has international businesses. So if you're doing it, we're dealing with a company um, in Europe and you're a Ghanaian company, that's when you really, really put GDPR into, into focus because, well, people are checking on the other side. Locally, there's data protection and other private institutions trying to uh, let us know how important these are with the emergence of emerging technologies and IoT as a whole. Mm -hmm. I want to repeat again, if you do have a question, stand in front of the microphone or hold up your hand. I have many questions, so we can keep going. I wonder in Indonesia, is there a question? Uh, please come forward. If you like, you can introduce yourself as well. Hi, I'm a data protection guy. My name is Klaus, and this is a question addressed to our African guests. I assume that there's a lot of mobile phone users, maybe less smartphones. So what is the security aspect or in which way are you dealing with these issues? Thank you. Can I attend? Okay, well, he is a law enforcer, so he will have the final say. Um, <laughs> yes, from where I sit and from um, engagements I've had with people, especially during the cybersecurity, uh, you no know, girls in IT day in somewhere April, we had somebody from the Ghana Police Service talking about statistics regarding cyber crimes, especially using mobile phones, and uh, yeah, we call it very popular in our parlance, we call it Sakawa. And what he realized was that there is, there's been increase yearly in the number of um, attacks um, via mobile phone, people calling and actually faking, and somebody has to send a lot of money to do something, and later on, later out, later on finds out that it was not legit in the first place. And there are many things that guide this, like you said, um, you will find out that there's a crime, but how do you imprison somebody or how do you go through to actually um, penalizing somebody if there's nothing that holds? In Ghana, there are some things that we talk about, like once there's a crime online, there's a cyber crime unit in the criminal investigative um, department of the Ghana police. So with that, they can follow through and find out. But most of this will actually go through a lot of processes because the, the crime might have been and perpetrated from somewhere in the world with a Ghanaian number or maybe a foreign number also and more. But the crime is very prevalent actually. Mm -hmm. And in Ghana, the trend is actually moving from desktop and online to more mobile phone because that is really, really accessible. Mm -hmm. 
So everybody has, um, can actually grab one. It's accessible, so the crimes are really prevalent with those. And um, in enforcing or in trying to curb all these, um, we have the um, CID department and the cyber crime talking about it and let people, letting people know that there's, there's more to somebody calling you and giving you directions and, and, and sounding so alarmed and wanting help to you thinking through and leaving the human bit aside for a while mm -hmm. and trying to help. And that's what's happening currently in Ghana. And from what I know, let's the, the law enforcer. <laughs> uh, so basically in Zambia, the use of mobile smartphones is actually high. Actually, there are more mobile smartphones than there are more mobile smartphones in use than non-smartphones. So basically, I will tackle your questions on two fronts. On the first front is owning a mobile phone in itself, you don't need to register to anyone. However, if you want to buy a SIM card to use in that mobile device, there are laws that governs how, in terms of registration, like the providers through our regulator have to get your details and your biometrics, meaning your face, they'll have to capture your image in the event that a crime has been committed, when people are doing biodata uh, uh, acquisition, like they want to know who is behind this phone number, at least your, your face will come alongside, your, alongside that information that you use for registration. Because the, the, in terms of crime, uh, there's been a major increase when it comes to swim swap. Back home, we, we transact. We have, we have another smart way of transacting cashless, which is called mobile money. We don't go to the ATM. We, we still go to the ATM like in a conventional way, but for easy transfer of cash, we have what is called mobile money, where you transfer money within the mobile devices and the numbers that are registered within that platform. So because money now sits in the digital form, the rate at which crimes now are committed in terms of frauds are high. Then I'll answer your question in terms of the, the other security aspect of it. Say, I have this mobile device. Say there is a problem with uh, probably one application or the operating system of this mobile device is probably compromised and there is an update. So basically, in Africa, the cost of data is high. Very few, and I mean very few people actually would update their mobile devices to the latest software or any other patch that, can be, that is released. Because if, if you want to spend one GB of data to update your mobile phone, the first thing is you look is the cost, not the actual importance of that patch you bring into your mobile device. Because if you don't patch your device, probably somebody will hack into your banking application on your mobile phone or who have your information that sits on your mobile phone compromised. So basically, the cost of internet accessibility and affordability in Africa, actually, I'll say affordability because access is there, but affordability is actually compromising on the aspect of security. Thank you. <clears throat> do we have online questions? We, we, do we? No. We talked a bit about regulators who maybe don't understand the technology, but that is also a problem in the civil society sector. And I wonder, in your experience in Indonesia, trying to fight uh, plans around smart cities or invasive, uh, privacy invasive technologies that are being implemented, what, what challenges have you found um, getting broader support from civil society? Are the women's groups involved? Are the youth groups involved? What is missing for um, the citizen voice to become more impactful for the future? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> based in uh, our experience, uh, the government, uh, they are often of, uh, give the, what is, uh, the tactical response or a sporadic response to the uh, innovation of the technology with the uh, technical uh, regulation aspect. 
uh, but uh, this regulation uh, in uh, several times limiting of the rights of the peoples. So uh, the civil society, including the vulnerable groups, uh, vulnerable community, try to identify what is the impact uh, of the uh, technological innovation, especially to the uh, vulnerable groups, uh, because in the several uh, situation, the technological innovation, uh, uh, what is creating the new discrimination, especially to the uh, vulnerable groups. So uh, the civil society try to uh, set up of the uh, own of the regulation or the, uh, the, the recommendation of the regulation uh, to the government because uh, the government, uh, they are often of the, uh, have the lack of the knowledge and lack of the understanding about the, what is the impact uh, of the technology to the uh, rights and what is the impact of the technology to the uh, 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 fulfill, fulfillment of the rights, etc. So uh, the JSOs try to uh, based on the uh, democratic system, try to engage with the government uh, with the model of the critical engagement. Uh, in the uh, uh, several times we give the, uh, what is the fully recommendation to the government, but in the uh, other occasion, the civil society try to criticize uh, all of the policies or of the, uh, what is the pro a program from the, from the government. So we try to, uh, uh, develop the models of the strategic engagement with the government to uh, implement of the uh, multi-stakeholder approach in the uh, internet uh, policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're about at time. We've heard a bit about this automated car with, with no driver. Um, I, I remember the first time that I saw one. I think I'm not from Africa, and I was not in Africa, but I was still as startled as the, the people that you described. Um, and it was in Mountain View, California, and suddenly it made sense to me because there were no people walking anywhere around. There are no pedestrians in that part of America. And so all of a sudden, a car with no driver seemed less risky. Um, and I think it, it's, it was an interesting moment for me in terms of technology is developed in one part of the world, it's implemented somewhere else. It's difficult to see all the ramifications of implementation in different parts of the world. We've heard from civil society, youth groups, um, corporate sector, government, and I think it's important that all of us hold each other in check. Um, there are risks in terms of all of our behaviors and engagements with these technologies, um, and I hope that we can look forward to a brighter future where we understand these things um, and work towards some more trustworthy IoT for everybody. Thank you very much for listening this late evening talk. Thanks. <laughs>